Less than 20 years ago, coal was the dominant form of electricity production in the UK, in the US, in China and in Germany. Yet today, its usage is falling almost everywhere. Is this the result of overzealous environmental legislation? Or is something deeper going on? Are there simply better, cleaner, cheaper ways of generating power? The answer is... Shocking! She's electric She's in a family full of eccentrics She's done things I've never expected In the good old days, say about 1995, electricity generation was simple. Planning went like this. A bright spark would ask what the annual low and high points were for electricity demand. The low point, the level that was always needed, that was baseload. Power companies would build a lot of inflexible, but cheap to run, power stations to supply this. In most places in the world, these were, and in some cases still are, coal and nuclear. Then there was peaking power. This was flexible, more expensive power, used when demand exceeded baseload. Now, here's the question everyone asks. Given baseload power is supposed to be cheaper, why not simply build a whole bunch of coal or nuclear plants? Well, here's the big secret. Baseload isn't cheaper anymore. In fact, coal and nuclear now look like really expensive ways of generating power. Ooh, but how can that be possible? On a price per calorie basis, coal and nuclear, like McDonald's fries, look really cheap. You see, here's the thing. Fuel is just one of the three costs involved in electricity generation. We need to think about the all-in cost. So first, there's capital, which is how much you need to spend to build a power station. Secondly, there are operational costs you'll incur, irrespective of how much power you generate, the people manning the plant and the maintenance you need to do. Thirdly, there are the marginal costs of production. This is fuel and, in some places, carbon credits. So, let's start with a coal-fired power station, like um, this one. Its capital costs are medium. It's not the most expensive type of plant to build, but nor is it the cheapest. The basic principle, burn coal, boil water, turn turbine, is simple and inexpensive. But plants require a lot of space because they need to stockpile coal and ash, and you need complex systems of conveyor belts to move coal from storage to furnace. Operating costs are also medium. There are a lot of moving parts in that coal-fired power plant and they need to be kept in good working order. The ash needs to be regularly removed and dealt with, and coal plants require a degree of managing to keep them at optimum efficiency. The furnace must be kept at the exact temperature to minimise your cost per kilowatt. This is not a simple process. Fuel, on the other hand, is cheap. Coal simply doesn't cost a lot to buy, although in some countries you will need to buy carbon credits. There's one final point with coal-fired power plants. They simply aren't very efficient. Only about 35% of the energy in coal is converted to electricity. Okay then, what about nuclear? Well, that has high capital costs, high operating costs, but low fuel costs. Plus, nuclear plants tend to have poor uptime because they require a lot of maintenance. And this is by no means all planned. Some nuclear plants have worse uptime records than offshore wind installations. And the list of nuclear power plants that have been built without government support is very small. And by very small, I mean non-existent. Nuclear power simply does not exist without government subsidy. Let me give you an example. UK wholesale power prices right now are around £50 per megawatt hour. Hinkley Point C, supposedly a modern and inexpensive plant, is only being built because the government has guaranteed £92.50 per megawatt hour index linked. And it's by no means clear that even with this massive subsidy, that it will be profitable. Okay, now let's talk about natural gas, and in particular, a modern combined cycle gas turbine, or CCGT. These plants contain two different systems, the combined cycle, for generating electricity. First, there's something that looks, and works, very much like a jet engine, with the burning of the gas directly turning a turbine. The exhaust from this turbine, still being very hot, is used to boil water, which turns the steam, and which turns a second turbine. Surprisingly, Capital costs are medium to low for these plants because although the turbine itself is expensive, it's typically bought off the shelf from Siemens or GE, and it requires much less space than a coal plant as there are no piles of fuel or waste. 
Operational costs are low because there's a high degree of automation. There's no ash to clear, no need for conveyor belts to move coal around, and the flow of gas can be tuned automatically to optimize the temperature. Historically, fuel costs were high, but with the falling price of gas, they're now medium and maybe even low. Gas burns very cleanly, producing relatively little carbon dioxide and none of the nasty nitrous oxide that coal does. It's also usually inexpensive to get gas from the field to the plant because pipes are cheap compared to boats, trains and trucks. And finally, a much larger portion of the energy content of gas is converted to electricity. Few plants operate at less than 55% and some have gotten as high as 62 or 63%. Did I mention that natural gas plants can be turned on and off relatively quickly and easily as well? Little wonder natural gas is taking share from coal. Simply, even if we aren't concerned with the environmental impacts, it's a cheaper and more efficient way to generate electricity. But the case against coal gets stronger when we start thinking about wind and solar power. These forms of power generation are intermittent. Unlike with coal or gas, you don't know when they're going to be generating power. Now, historically, renewables were expensive. Not anymore. Wind's capital costs might be high, but it has low operating and zero fuel costs. Solar has exceptionally high capital costs, but essentially zero operating or fuel costs. If we put all these costs together, we come up with what's called the levelized cost of electricity. Now, this is a somewhat simplistic measure, as it is important to have power that can be turned on if your nuclear plant is down for unscheduled maintenance, it's nighttime and the wind isn't blowing. But it's not that simplistic, particularly if the cost of having backup power is low. So, if you look behind me, this chart is from the US Energy Information Administration, i.e. the government. And what it shows is the projected levelized cost of energy for new plants for the US in 2020. The cheapest form of electricity down here is geothermal, which is great, but there are only a small number of practical locations. The next two cheapest, here and here, are natural gas and wind. Now, if you look at this chart, then solar on this side of me, it appears quite expensive with the variation in cost depending on the location of the panels. This shouldn't surprise us. Minnesota gets less sun than Nevada. But even so, the chart overstates the effective cost of solar. You see, power generated by wind, nuclear, gas, etc. needs to get from the power station to the houses, shops, offices and factories where it's used. A lot of solar isn't like that. It's increasingly distributed generation that's consumed where generated. It's therefore not competing with cheap wholesale power, but with much more expensive retail. To use the UK as an example, wholesale electricity, i.e. what you will pay to get it from the plant, sells at 5 pence per kilowatt hour, while retail is about 14 pence. And there's a final advantage to solar. If you have panels on your roof, then the benefits to you show up as a lower electricity bill, which is tax-free income in that it's offsetting a cost. And as the chart behind me shows, solar's price continues to decline. At a certain point, it becomes cheap enough that almost every home and office will have panels on the roof. And the more solar there is installed, the less need there will be, especially during the J, for traditional power generation. What's needed instead is flexible, cheap backup power. And that's a role that neither coal nor nuclear can fill. Now, a lot of people will say, ah, but won't we end up paying more for electricity? The solar and wind is expensive and we'll need to build lots of backup power when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing. So even if the solar itself is cheap, the need to build fossil fuel power stations anyway removes any cost advantage. And then said person will point to Germany or Denmark and say, hey, look, those guys get a lot of their electricity from renewables and look at their power prices. And then they'll usually add, the only way to keep power prices low is to load up on coal and ban expensive solar and wind. Now, this argument is not entirely stupid. You see, Germany and Denmark do have high electricity prices. But you see, the Germans did you and me and, and the world for that matter an enormous favour. 15 years ago, they decided to put in very generous programmes to subsidise solar and wind. If you put solar panels on your roof or in a field on your farm, you would receive a fixed fee called the feed-in tariff for the electricity you generated for the next 20 years. And the prices paid at the start of this programme were enormous. Back in 2005, if you installed a rooftop solar system, then for the next 20 years, the government would pay you 50 cents a kilowatt hour for the electricity generated, which is approximately 10 times what a traditional power plant would receive. 
This generosity resulted in a brief German soil industry, remember Q cells, and lots of demand, which drove efficiencies of scale and lower prices. The German government responded by reducing every year what it would pay for new 20-year contracts. Look at the chart behind me and you can see that the price fell more than 80%, dropping to barely more than 10 cents per kilowatt hour. But economies of scale moved faster than the price went down. Solar installations rose every year between 2005 and 2012, only falling off when the feed-in tariff fell below the retail price of electricity. So, pulling this all together, what would be the cheapest way to power your home today if you lived in, say, Bavaria in Germany, or indeed for that matter, Los Angeles in California? Well, the answer is probably some solar panels on the roof, a battery like this one, and maybe one of these. What is it? This is a personal gas-fired power station. It takes gas from the grid and kicks out electricity. But you see, it gets better. Your local traditional power station, where the fossil fuel and nuclear works by heating up water until it becomes steam and turning a turbine. And the hot water? It's mostly vented into the atmosphere by cooling towers. Wouldn't it be great if there was something we could do with that water? Well, it turns out that in most homes, uh, well, it turns out that in all homes, there is a demand for hot water. It's used for showers, baths, radiators, dishwashers, and washing machines. Little generators like this, or indeed fuel cell devices like this, take in natural gas and kick out electricity and hot water. And here's the best thing. Demand for hot water in the home is highest when the sun is shining least brightly. In the depths of winter when it's cold, well, that's when you'd be heating the most water anyway. Electricity is a free byproduct. A world based around distributed generation with these combined heating and power units would be more resilient and lower cost. Now, these devices are currently a bit large and a bit expensive for most homes, and they're most likely to be installed in apartment blocks. But that's changing. And every one of these units that's put into service, just like every solar panel on a roof, reduces demand for base load energy. And so we have this crazy mixed up world. A decade ago, it was the environmentalists who demanded subsidies. They said the externalities of coal weren't being captured by wholesale electricity prices. But subsidies for new wind and solar are collapsing everywhere, and yet the amount being installed keeps rising. The demand for subsidies is now coming from traditional power. Uh, Bob Murray, the chap behind me and the CEO of coal miner Murray Energy, wants laws that force electricity firms to, to burn coal. His demand sounds pretty good to politicians like um, this guy. But those who promise to use legislation and subsidies to save coal and nuclear are peddling a false dream. Utilities increasingly don't need base load power. Introducing legislation to force them to buy what they don't need pushes up electricity prices for homes and businesses, which makes rooftop solar even more attractive and further reduces the need for coal. Well, that pretty much wraps up my thoughts on power generation. I will revisit this topic in a future video because there are other important factors such as energy efficiency and electric cars and smart meters and intelligent electrical grids and battery technologies that will further change the energy landscape in coming years. So, for now, Thank you very much for watching and please hit the subscribe button if you've not already done so. Goodbye.